Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so the title of this talk is Building a Dynamic Single Page Application. Uh, but first, uh, I, like I, I know we just had a formal introduction, but I thought I'd just put my name up here and say, so this is my Twitter account. You should find me. I'll tweet the slides afterwards. So I'll put it again in the end. Um, I'm from Denmark. I work at Impact. Whoa, the slides are weird. So this, this is all yellow. Uh, but uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, we are uh, we're a consultancy. We do uh, e-commerce for large clients. And uh, if you are looking to relocate to something where you don't need an air conditioner, you should come to Denmark and uh, work with me. <laughs> it's cold. Uh, so uh, in Aarhus, my local city, I run an, uh, an Angular uh, user group, um, which is the biggest one in Denmark now. I think we're competing with um, with Sherry down here running NG Copenhagen. So uh, a lot of good stuff. and. Um, like Martin before me, uh, I'm part of Google's uh, Developer Expert program. I do uh, focus on Angular mostly. But enough about that. Um, let's actually use some Angular and try to do something dynamic. So as I said, the title of this talk is Building a Dynamic Single Page Application. Uh, and uh, after I, I kind of worked with it, I, maybe I turned it into something like this, how to use Angular with your CMS. Because that's, that's basically the, the issue that I'm trying to tackle. Because uh, I know a lot of people like me have been using AngularJS with the CMS, and it works really well. You can have the CMS render out a nice template, whatever CMS you want. You can have just have Angular Bootstrap on top of that, AngularJS Bootstrap on top of that. And when it sees a basket component, it'll just render it. And then when it sees a some whatever directive, it'll use it. Um, and uh, And we. That's that's kind of what I, what I wanted to do with Angular, Angular 2 or just Angular, because um, it gives us a lot of the stuff and it uh, that we wanted uh, that weren't uh, weren't really in Angular JS, uh, and it's performs really well and it's especially on big teams it, it's uh, it's a really nice uh, framework or platform it's just in, it's the new word I guess, um, so so in Angular JS I'll just do this as I said. Uh, but obviously, we can't do that. We need to bootstrap a component. And in, in just Angular, it looks like this. So we'll just have our ng module. We'll say bootstrap the app component. Uh, but the problem is that, like I said, if, we want, if we're using the server to render out templates or, or render, out, render out the pages, like we don't, there's, no, there's not really a root app. So we can have multiple entry points, and that's really how AngularJS was 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 doing its thing, um, where you would say, so this page has a page component or has a, a basket component or something. The CMS would know this and could then tell Angular to to you know bootstrap a, a basket component over here and a gallery component here, and there would be separate Angular apps, um, and it could work. Uh, it's a little harder if you want to maintain. You know, have a shared service when you're bootstrapping multiple applications, but it, it, it's possible. But it's uh, it's it gets even harder if you want to do if you then want to have two galleries on the same page because, like, as I as you see here, or you see in the like, I'm not really giving it any DOM endpoint. I'm just saying so bootstrap a basket component or a gallery component. So if there's multiple, Angular would just assume I mean the first one and, and don't do the second one. Uh, so, and we would need the CMS to kind of know. So this page contains these components, and these this is not Angular components and stuff. So the CMS would have to know a lot, and we don't really want that. And another problem is like we would uh, feed it some initial data, like maybe the the images for for the gallery or the products that would go in the basket. Uh, they should come from the server as well. So maybe we would you know feed them in from an input. We could do something like this. So we could do an input with the basket items, uh, or and if we want to have a template from the server, we could do we could use transclusion and use the ng content uh, in the template. But it turns out you can't do that either. So root components they don't have inputs. They don't support that. Root components they can't reuse content projection or transclusion as you know it from AngularJS. Uh, and if you want to look into that, there's a long there's a GitHub issue down here where there where there's a lot of talk back and forth of whether this should be possible or why it shouldn't be and stuff, but yeah. So this is the this is the state of uh, of where it is today. So I was in kind of a hacky mood when I when I came to this realization. This was probably 12 months ago, uh, 
And I, and I thought to myself, so how about we make a body component? And uh, we want the body component to have the template of the page being coming from the CMS. So maybe we could do something like this. So the template, we get that directly from the body's inner HTML, and we render out a body, temp a body uh, component. And it turns out that this actually works. <laughs> but I still, like, it just, it feels, it feels so wrong. Uh, and, it, and it is, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, would, we, we couldn't ahead of time compile, because obviously we don't know ahead of time what the CMS will output. And, and uh, we would need the parser at runtime, so Angular would be huge and slow and stuff. So yeah, so this is just to, to you know, take you on the journey that led me to, towards thinking we really need our CMS to be able to handle a single page application. So a single page application is, uh, I, I'm sure you all know, we can have nice animations between routes. We can have uh, um, shared services across pages, and, and uh, we don't have all the, the lazy or the, the crappy UI of, of reloading the page every time you click something. So obviously, like everybody else, a single page application was, is what we want. So I thought I'd, I'd put in a, a demo. And just before I show the demo, beware that uh, I do front end stuff, but I mostly do code and not as much uh, design. And I designed this myself. So it's not going to be pretty. And uh, since this was actually the, the real demo that I, that I ended up building, it's in Danish. So beware with it. But there it is uh, uh, showing off content coming from the CMS, where you can click around. You can have uh, animations when you click. You can have pages having different uh, templates. So there might there's a front page, and there's a sub page, and there's a sub page with two columns, and all that stuff. And everything's co uh, configured on the server. Um, there's even a product page, because obviously we do uh, commerce. So we click around. We get some text content that are variable. We have more columns. There's a product page where we can filter, filter products and all that kind of stuff. So this is what I wanted to build. But it turns out it's a little, bit, it's a little hard. So with Angular, uh, using the router is pretty simple. You define an array of routes. And you say, so when you go to the uh, nothing path, uh, you use the front page component. When you go to the slash products, you get the product page component. Um, but that's not really dynamic. So one of the things that we need is for the editor uh, to be able to change stuff uh, while the user is actually on the page. And, uh, and even, like, we, we could have a ton of routes. We do have a ton of routes and uh, a ton of different page types, or so a front page and a sub page and a product page. And there's no clear pattern in what route is what template. So like, it's, it's, a, it's pretty hard to do. So, so I went and talked to the Angular team, and they were like, so maybe you could have the CMS actually output the, the entire route config. And, and this would obviously work. So the CMS would know that slash cheese slash some cheese would, is a cheese and should be a product page, uh, and that slash basket slash checkout is a checkout page. And the CMS who knows all of this already. And that should live in the CMS. But it, it's, it doesn't scale very well, because you know, we might have, uh, for some products uh, or pages that we build, we, we, may, we may have a million products, or even more. Uh, or we, and we might have a lot of uh, stuff that changes a lot. So the, pro the, the fact that we need to have everything, all the routes up front, uh, that it doesn't really work that well. And, um, and, the, and the other problem is that the users would get stuck on the route config that we loaded when they first visited the website. So you know, we, with a single page application, people could use the website, you know, close down their laptop, go on vacation, come back two weeks later, open it, and just keep on, keep on clicking. And by then, everything would have changed. So maybe that this product is not, no longer stuck, or maybe uh, this category is no longer available or, or is named something differently or whatever. So it, it, it doesn't really work so well. So I thought to myself, I was in the same hacky mode, and I thought to myself, one route to rule them all. And uh, you know, I imagine we should have this, the CMS output a, a piece of uh, JSON that would say, so when I go to the front page, it's a, the template. It should use the template front page. It should, use, it should have the page title of front page. It's because it's a front page, it should have a 
some data that's specific to the page template. So here it has a here here it has a header and uh, some spots with which is you know an image spot and a text spot and stuff. Um, and uh, and in Angular you you can you can make a, a route that matches any route by putting two stars in it. Uh, and we could have this, uh, and this actually is kind of what we ended up using. And, and I and I thought to myself, so we should get the data in the resolve. So a resolve is a is a is a thing you put on a route where you say before you can actually enter this route, do this thing, and we'll wait for that to to finish, and then we can have that data available as soon as the route is, is activated. And and in Angular, a resolver is just a, a, a class. That has a resolve method on it, and this is just a little bit of boilerplate. I, th I just thought I'd put it all up so you can see it if you want to copy the slides. Um, but you know, it t makes a, it, it ends up going to an HTTP service and calling web API slash blah 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 and sending the URL to that, and that will give us back the JSON. And and here's the problem. So in Angular JS, we could we could have then said uh, so. We want to use the front page, so we'll put in the front the front page tag or the front page component in a string, and just have Angular render that out. And uh, as I said, like we don't in Angular, uh, in new Angular, we, we don't we don't want the parser at runtime. We want to be able to ahead of time compile, and um, so this this approach doesn't really work. So I came up with a smart solution. So this is kind of hacky again, just to be a, just to be making sure. So we could put all page components that should be available on the same page and have ngifs on them all. <laughs> Some happy people laughed at that. <laughs> uh, so it, it would look something like this. And um, this was actually part one of my early prototypes uh, where I was like, OK, so we should do front page. If the template is front page, use this, uh, blah, blah, blah. You get it. Uh, but I put back this slide because oh, that feels so wrong again. Like I know when we compile all this stuff, uh, like we can actually like all the ngifs will be something nice and it, it won't be a template and stuff. So it'll be some kind of compiled stuff. But it's, it's like the, we shouldn't have that information in the template. But for now it works um, until you start navigating around because nothing happens. So when you click a link, nothing happens. It turns out we're not ch changing the route. We're just changing route options. It, so because of how uh, the router is working, we won't get a new resolve because we're still on the same route. Uh, we won't get a new ng on init because uh, we're still on the same route. So <laughs> I started refactoring, and I was like, eh, we can listen for the route change event in the page component and then do, uh, then do the resolve in there and, um, and then do it. So this actually works as well. So we're listening. We're listening to the URL uh, observable from the activated route, and every time that changes, we're getting the page resolve uh, and uh, you, and getting that data, assigning it to the view, and we're back to having it working. We can now click around until you click from ro one product page to the next product page, because then the problem kind of cascades. Because then we'll have to do the same thing in all the pa page templates. Because if their options change, uh, they won't be reloaded. Um, yeah. So uh, along came RC4. And in RC4, so this was maybe 12 months ago, 10 months ago, something like that. Um, and th in RC4 came the component factory resolver. And uh, that kind of gave us the ability to get rid of all the ugly NGFs in the template. So the theory about this is that we can, um, we can find the factory uh, from uh, the component class. So we'll give it the front page component class. And it'll actually re return the factory that you use to create a component like this. And you can create the component dynamically. You can create it yourself and assign it to a view. Uh, so in practice, it looks like this. But it's not like the implementation is not really the important thing here. Um, but yeah, so we, we find it from a list of all the components. Uh, we put it in the view. And then we assign the rest of the data. Or so all of the data, we assign that to, to that specific component. So what components should be available? Um, so we don't want to be able to put every component in as a page template. We, may, we like in my methodology or in my terminology, I call it uh, you know page components or something, page type components, or page template components, or something like this. Um, so I would uh, 
I, I came up with the solution where I, uh, you know, I, I keep an array of uh, of all the components that sh where that you should be able to to use this way, um, and then I'll put a static uh, member on the classes with the reference. So when I do the lookup, that I just set like you can see it here in line 23 ish. Uh, what I do here is I do page components dot find and the le that'll actually go through all the components that I have and look directly on the on the component class, not the instance. So that's why it has to be a static member. Uh, and see when when that matches the the template I get from the server, we'll use that one. So, yeah. So we're back to we really need a route change. So all the ugly subscribing inside uh, uh, that kind of doesn't work so well. So if you've been following along with Angular, you know that the uh, the router has changed a couple of times. Just a couple of times. But for this router. <laughs> Um, it is possible to uh, make your custom re router reuse strategy. And that it's kind of a weird name. Maybe, maybe uh, somebody in here, where are you, did it. <laughs> um, but I like, I like how it works. Uh, and uh, you know, we implement a router reuse strategy. And so this is just an implementation of don't ever reuse anything. Just put a new, give me a new router any time I want. And that's basically what I want. So every time there's a route change, I'll get a new page component. Uh, so I'm back to having the resolver work, getting the data there, having ng on it on all my page components. Uh, so this is how you use it. You just register it uh, and say, when provide the router reuse strategy with my custom router reuse strategy. So um, rich text, it's another big thing when, you, when you're in a CMS context. So Almost any CMS has something that like, looks kind of like this. So this is Sitecore, because that's what we use. Uh, but that's not really important. So you type in stuff. You can make stuff bold, and you can make links and put in all weird stuff. Uh, and it ends, it ends up you know, in the JSON. It just looks like a big old string of HTML. And in AngularJS, this was super simple. You could do ng-bind HTML, and it would work, and everything would be nice. Um, it's a little bit harder in Angular. Um, or actually, it turns out it's not really that hard. Because in Angular, you could bind directly to uh, properties and on elements. So we can actually just put a div in and say, so bind directly to the inner HTML of this div and put the content in there. So that works. It's perfect, except for links. Because like if in AngularJS, we're used to the router in intercepting links. So when you click on a link and you have a router on the page, uh, the router will take over and actually uh, route. But in Angular, because we don't have the parser, it doesn't know that it's a link. Uh, it's just a regular ATAC when you put it in via the uh, inner HTML attribute or property. Uh, so, so I thought to myself, we will make an href directive. We'll be super clever because we need to have, you know, we need to put in a router link a directive to maybe be able to click it. Uh, but obviously, we can't do that either because we still don't have the parser. So anything you put in via the inner HTML property is not going to be parsed. So Angular won't know that you put in it, even though it's a valid directive, it won't know it. So um, I went back to the drawing board and I started thinking and I talked to some people uh, from the Angular team again and, the, and, and they got some good advice and they were, they were saying, we should, you should do a host listener. So if you don't know, a host listener is something you can put on a component and say, listen for something on me uh, for an event. And since events in, on the web or in the DOM is, are so awesome that they bubble, we can just, on the, on the tag where we put in uh, their inner HTML, we could ju just make a directive and have that directive have a host listener. And that's what I did. I called it intercept links. And uh, what it does is you put it on where you put the inner HTML in. It listens for a click event, and it then fires the this router dot navigate by URL. So uh, I put a start on here because it's in reality it's a little more complicated because you have to handle links that that the router shouldn't handle, or if the if the event is triggered from not the a tag but some but maybe a bold tag inside of the a tag or something because you have to find the closest parent that's an, that's a, that's an a tag and has an href and stuff. But I take took that out of the implementation here because it's ugly. Um, but, but this actually works. This, this approach is, is pretty sweet. So 
we, we were at a place now where we, where we have uh, pretty much everything we wanted. We don't have all the ugly parts anymore. So no more NGFs, no more uh, listening for stuff, no more putting in templates and parsing them. Uh, we have real routes where we can get the data in a real resolve. We can do route change animations. We can actually handle rich text and dynamic links and all the stuff that we wanted from a CMS. And this approach is, should work with any CMS. So uh, like we built it for Sitecore, but you should, you should be able to build it for anything or, or use my implementation if you want to. So obviously, like uh, on some of the pages I showed, there were uh, you know, a row of, of spots, we call them, or blocks or content or whatever, content elements or whatever you call them, them in other CMSs. But obviously, the, the, the approach is, is kind of similar. You just you know, loop over uh, an array of items and, and do some, some dynamic stuff out of it. So the cool thing is that because this is built the way it is, it just works out of the box with AOT. So if you haven't played along with AOT, like you, you have to, because it's so simple now. You just put the, the prod flag. You don't even need the AOT flag anymore. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's standard now if you use the prod flag on the ng-build command. And, um, and this will actually uh, you know, do all the nice tree shaking and compile all your templates in advance and make your app really, really fast. So this is really awesome. I think you have to note, though, is that uh, stuff that's only being used by the router, uh, you have to declare that in, uh, in entry components. So on your ng-module, more than just adding all your page components, so I'm sp just spreading the array here uh, to make it obvious that it's a list of, of, uh, of components. Uh, but you have to also put it in entry components, because otherwise the tree shaker doesn't see it in any templates, and it'll just throw them away because they're not used. But you know better, because you know they will be used. So you add them to entry points and or entry, entry components, and they'll, they'll be in your bundle. So just by doing this, the initial parse time went from a half a second to a quarter of a second for our application. And uh, the bundle size went from uh, something like 4 megabytes to 200 kilobytes. So like it, it works really, really well. Um, one more thing to add, though, uh, is server-side rendering. Because, as I said, we do e-commerce. SEO is really, really important for e-commerce. It is for everybody, but especially for e-commerce, because if people don't see your shop, they don't buy anything. And that's really the point of having a, a web shop. But also, if you're not building something that where s SEO is important, most likely social previews, previews will be, because people will be sharing this to Facebook or to Twitter or something. and. Um, and you know, officially, Google, the Google bot runs uh, JavaScript, and we know it sometimes doesn't. Maybe, uh, but uh, all we know that Facebook and Twitter and all their bot crawlers they don't. So if we, if you want to have a nice output, you have to have some kind of server-side rendering uh, going on. Uh, I started looking into this, and like at the time, it was called Angular Universal before it came into to to the core. And it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to, to, to wrap your head around. So I thought I would, I would try to explain it in a, in, a, in a relatively simple way. So it turns out you still ba build your regular app module, and then you just wrap it on the server. You wrap it in a server module, and in, on the client, you wrap it in the client module. And, uh, and they still just have used the same application. So all your application is still the same, uh, but then you just wrap it in one thing on the server and in one thing on the client. Um, then the server and the client module, or ma mainly the server module, will then replace some of the dependencies. So because we can't do uh, XHR on this on, in Node, we have to do something else. It'll change up that dependency for us. We don't have the all the DOM stuff. We don't have the window object and all that stuff on the server. So Angular or the the the, the server module will then replace all these dependencies for you. So it's pretty easy to use. So one thing to note, though, is obviously you can't use the DOM. Um, so you can't do window.something. You can't do query selector. You can't do uh, local storage and all these kinds of stuff because they're not available on, on, in Node. So if you're doing them, make sure that you, like if you need to use them, make sure that you wrap them in something or you put a big old if is browser around them so it, it's not run on, on the server. Um, so. This is how it would look. So as you see in the last line here, this is the browser app module. And uh, there's a little bit of boilerplate here. But in, in line 18, it just imports your, your app module. And that's basically all it needs. And here's the, bit, the, the, good, the good part. So the server module, you see that how it's almost the same. Uh, so these files are almost the same. 
there's a, there's a little bit of difference because obviously the server won't need all the animation stuff, and the, uh, and, but it, it will need the overriding of all the DOM stuff. Uh, so that's basically the, the only difference between the two. Um, one thing with server-side rendering, though, is like we want to maintain the state. So in this, like in the example I'm using here, where we're going to a route, and the route is then asking the server to see what kind of page it should render, uh, it doesn't make any sense to server-side render that if when the client bootstraps back up, it needs to ask the server again. So we need to have some kind of mechanism where we can put something in, uh, in a store or a state service or whatever we want to call it, um, and then have it be available immediately when the client loads. So some of the guys from the Universal team, they, 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 they thought of this concept, and I, I kind of just stole some of their code and made it my own. Um, I called it a state transfer service, where you, there's there's a service where you can just has a regular get method or an, an input method, and um, you can put anything into it. And then it has a method where where it'll take everything that's currently in the store and serialize it down to one a string of JSON, and that's what it will do when the app is finished loading on the server. Um, and then when the when the client bootstraps, it'll start out by taking that string of JSON and and main, and getting back all the states. Uh, so. It is a little bit heavy, so I thought I'd just you know zoom in a little bit and, and you know on the on the server. Uh, so this is the the server module uh, of the state transfer server. Uh, we just register an app bootstrap listener and call a method that we create. We call it on bootstrap here, and so uh, this is more or less the code I stole from them. Um, so you know we find the HTML tag and we put an, a script tag in it, and then uh, the the important part is down here in line 38 where it says get this. The dehydrate the, the state transfer services data, uh, and then on the on the client it uh, it it just does the inverse. So it reads from the Windows state transfer object and rehydrates the service from it. So it's it's pretty simple, uh, and it, and it and it works really well because uh, this way when we when we reload the page the data will be to be there immediately and we there won't be any uh, additional HTTP requests going on. Uh, so it's going to be uh, interactive really really fast. So server-side rendering is really, really cool. Uh, it's still a little bit like, I mean, at least for us, we're a, we're a .NET house, and we do we host all of our stuff. We're not used to running Node on the server. Uh, so obviously, we're not the best in the world at that. So we kind of wanted, wanted to make a, a solution where we're not depending only on that. I mean, luckily, like if the, if the, if the, the universal server or the, the Angular server-side renderer server it doesn't work. We can just fall back to regular attack that will then bootstrap the application on the on the client. But we also kind of wanted to cache uh, the response of the server side uh, render. It doesn't work so well with with, uh, with personalization though, because that would make like I would I would want to have the product page, you know, maybe just be able to serve it directly from a CDN, so it could be fast for everybody, and then have Angular take over from there. But Maybe some products aren't available in the country that you're in, or maybe uh, we've s we know that you're a customer that never buys milk, so we'll take the made up milk out of the list for you, or whatever. So we can't really do personalization that way. So I came up with three strategies for handling how to do personalization when we're um, server-side rendering your content. So obviously, we could, we could do it at launch, so just, uh, just don't put it in that state service. So at launch, it'll just go ahead and fire off the request again and re-render the, the, the page whenever the data returns from the server. And I mean, for some things, that might be the, the good thing to do. It's very easy to do. You don't have to do anything about it. You just don't do anything. This, this is how it will work. Um, but maybe a more appropriate re reason or more be a, a more appropriate thing would be to, to personalize after the first user interaction. So. When the when the user then says, "I only want to see, you know, products or that are below 100 euros or 10 euros or whatever, or make some kind of filtering of the list," then we'll, uh, you know, ask the server. It'll respond, and obviously that response will be personalized. So then all the milk will be taken out or whatever is is, is your personal preference. So that's a way to do it. Or maybe for some cases it just doesn't make sense to server side render this. So maybe, like maybe in the top of the screen we'll show. Hello, Philip. If you're logged in, and that 
like that would never make sense in a in a server side rendered uh, uh, you know uh, version because like we would never know who you were uh, and we would never get anything right and the wrong information out there would just be weird so it it wouldn't be a a, a slightly less relevant product list it would be something wrong uh, so we we don't want that so I built a, a no server side render uh, directive uh, which is you know it's really simple. It's just saying so. If the platform is, ser is the server, uh, we'll just clear the view containers so and you know stop all the the, the rendering in here. So we could imagine just putting this uh, directive on you know the hello name thing in the top of the the browser window when you're logged in, or on anything else that should be personalized that doesn't make sense unpersonalized. Super simple. We put it all together and do a view source, and we see here we actually have our entire website. And in the top, we have the, the, the state transfer object that holds all the information that would normally come from the server uh, when you go to this route, and the rendered out route page. Um, and, and, and this is pretty much uh, all we wanted. So we made it to, uh, to Nirvana, or we made it. Uh, this, is, this is really, really cool. And as I said, this approach should, should work for any CMS uh, that can be made to output uh, page information as, as JSON or, or that kind of stuff. So that's all from me. This was building a dynamic single page application. My, you should follow me on, on Twitter. I'll tweet out a link to the slides. And um, there's a GitHub repo right here on the page. And this contains a working version that you can just clone down, npm install, npm run build, and you're good to go. You can see everything in production. So thank you very much.